All right, so <clears throat> go ahead. This is a presentation about the Tulsa Race Massacre. Welcome and hello, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this is a presentation by Ian Chung, Ian Song, Lindsay Kim, Ian Lim, and me, Manju. This is a tragic event that happened somewhere around after World War One and World War Two. And so well, let's get into it. All right, so the background of the Tulsa Race Massacre. <laughs> Tulsa Race Massacre, aka the Black Wall Street Massacre, was a horrendous tragedy that leaves a red stain in the history of the state of Oklahoma, as well as the history of the United States of America. Let's get into it. Starting with segregation. Segregation is the pa practice of uh, separate house requiring separate housing, education, and other services for people of color. The Supreme Court case Plessy v. Ferguson upheld the constitutionality of separate but equal facilities, further legitimizing Jim Crow laws. This included poll taxes, literacy tests, and grandfather clauses, which were implemented to disenfranchise African American voters. Jim Crow laws reached its peak in the 20th century with strict laws and social costumes that enforced racial segregation. I'll be talking about the KKK, which is a white supremacist group that arose in Oklahoma after the Civil War. And this group um, targeted mainly the Black population and other minorities in Oklahoma. And this white mob in Oklahoma, um, they were fueled by racial tension and economic jealousy of the thriving African-American community in Tulsa. And so they attacked Greenwood and its African-American residents. And some intimidation methods they used on them were lynchings, bombings, murders, kidnappings, torture, and more. Um, so more about Tulsa. Um, this um, this community was created out of necessity for survival for African Americans. Um, th they mass migrated to Tulsa, and this helped it to thrive. Um, white people moved, moving to Tulsa stayed clear of Greenwood, um, shielding Black Wall Street from white interference until 1921. Um, this community had about 10,000 residents, and there were about 100 block on Greenwood Avenue, which contained more than 70 businesses such as schools, barbershops, and cafes. Now the people, there were some important people that played a part in the Tulsa Race Massacre, as well as those who actually lived in Tulsa and made a big impact. These may include Sarah Page, Dick Rowland, and the Williams family, mainly Lola and John Williams. Here are these stories before or during the event. So Dick Rowland was adopted by Damie Rowland Ford, and he dropped out of high school in 1919, working as a shoe shiner for two years. He made enough money to buy flashy suits and jewelry, earning the name Diamond Dick. He worked, ac he worked across the street from the Drexel building, and by 1921, he was aged 19. He was also one of the main people involved in the Tulsa Race Massacre, setting off one of the worst acts of racism in history. Earlier in his life, he was... and he Okay. Sarah Page was raised in Arkansas at the age of 18. She married Robert Fisk. However, they got divorced two years later. In 1920, she got remarried to Raymond Page. Then she divorced again for a second time. This actually was not good for her because of her account because her accountability was very low to due to social standards and ideas at that time. When asked about the truth, not many believed her and some ignored her claims that Rowland did not sexually assault her. She worked as an elevator operator in Tulsa where she indirectly started the massacre. So next up in line is Laula and John Williams. And I really believe that they encased the spirit of the, Tulsa, of the Tulsa black community. And they were one of the first people to settle in Greenwood, creating the community and setting up the foundations as a whole. And as Jim Crow laws created segregation, they took advantage of this and Black Tulsans as they weren't welcomed in businesses. 
Um, so black entrepreneurs such as Lala and John Williams took advantage of this and created businesses that cater toward these um, black the black community. So John Williams owned an auto repair shop called East End Garage on the wall, Black Wall Street that catered towards both black and white people. And Lala Williams separately owned the Williams Confectionery that she bought with her own money, money that she saved up as a Hello? Yeah, yeah, did you cut off a little bit there? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Hello? Oh, okay, 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 because it lost me out a little. Um, as I was saying, Lala Williams separately owned the Williams Confectionery and the Dreamland Theater, two very popular places for the Black community members to visit. And it really encased not only the power that um, Black African Americans began to have during this time, but also the power that women began to have in the 1920s. And it was really revolutionary that Lala Williams got her own business separate from her husband. So John and, Willi John and Lala Williams were extremely successful. They really wrapped up, they really wrapped up the spirit of the Tulsa. So John and Lala Williams were extremely successful as they owned a large portion of businesses on Tulsa. And they were pioneers of the black community, encasing the spirit of Tulsa and the spirit of growth out of the out of black power, out of black owned power. Nothing with white interference. Now let's move on to the actual event. Spanning the course of a little over two days, the Black Wall Street massacre began on May 30th, 1921, igniting the buildup of racial tension that had built up in Tulsa. On May 30th, 1921, a 19-year-old Dick Rowland worked in a shoeshine parlor when he went to the bathroom at the Drexel office building, taking the elevator up. The elevator operator, Sarah Page, yelled as he tripped and accidentally and fell, accidentally grabbing her arm. He ran away frightened. Eventually, people found out about it and arrested Dick Rowland. Though we don't know what actually happened, that is the most popular theory on what happened. And May 31st, 1921, uh, police, police arrested Dick Rowland for the alleged sexual assault against Sarah Page. By the evening, an angry white mob gathered outside the courthouse demanding the sheriff to hand over Rowland. Sheriff William McCullough refused and his men barricaded the top floor to protect the black teenager. The same evening, a large group of armed black men went to the courthouse to guard Rowland and were met by over a thousand white men who some were, were armed. Shots were fired and the hours that followed were deadly and destructive. Um, so adding on, um, a white mob, including some members of the white supremacist group Ku Klux Klan, descended upon the Greenwood District and they looted, burned, and destroyed homes, businesses, and other places of worship. And this attack resulted in the destruction of approximately 35 city blocks out of the 100. And this included over 1,200 homes, numerous businesses, churches, schools, and the death of hundreds of other African Americans. So as we see, this tragic event not only had short-term and will not only have short-term and long-term effects, but we will see just how devastating these were. The Tulsa Race Massacre was both economically destructive as it was physical. Greenwood Avenue and the Greenwood District was blackened with burned buildings and stained red with blood. However, there were also long-term effects that stem from this tragedy. I am going to talk about the right. aftermath okay. of the events of the Tulsa Race Massacre. And yes, my Wi-Fi works now, so it's good. Um, this is the aftermath of the Tulsa Race Massacre. And as discussed before, the Tulsa Race Massacre caused a lot of deaths. And there's no known certain amount of people who have died during the Tulsa Race Massacre. But like, it's sure that no one was brought to justice. The government made it really hard for the citizens to rebuild as they issued zoning ordinances and funding went to majority white neighbors for reconstruction. And the government tried to cover up the real reason behind this massacre by labeling the event as the Tulsa race riot. And if you see on the post, 
part right next to um, all the words. It's labeled as Tulsa race riot to shift the blame onto African Americans. And it really shows how African Americans were like the victims and they were targeted and stereotyped to a bad light. And um, so 24 hours after the violence erupted, 35 city blocks lay charred in ruins. And most of these city blocks were part of Black Wall Street. And it is really just tragic how the African Americans built a community and it was just all burned by white supremacists. And more than 800 people were treated for injuries and historians believe that as many as 300 people may have died. But this isn't an accurate number as there was no clear record of deaths recorded, especially the African American deaths. And $1.8 million, $27 million in today's money was done in property damages and it really showed how hard it was for the African Americans to rebuild their community. So I want to talk about attempts for justice next. And like, as I said before, there wasn't a clear attempt for like the African American community and a lot of the compensation went to the um, white residents of Tulsa. So in 2020, three elderly survivors of the Tulsa race massacre tried to sue and get compensation. Um, however, unfortunately, Judge Carolyn Wall dismissed this case, so they were not given any compensation or any type of justice, even though it was a good attempt. The importance of the Tulsa Race Massacre. The Tulsa Race Massacre is was one of the bloodiest racial injustices in the history of America. Not only did it kill off hundreds of people and burn down more than a thousand homes, it effectively destroyed a whole community. The, this community of successful people, a community of incredible history, a community that prospered in a time of racism and prejudice, pre prejudice showing the resilience and perseverance that once held up to the town, had fallen due to the same racism and prejudice. It is a strong, strong reminder, reminder for us today that discrimination and hate should never be allowed. That is all for our presentation. Thank you very much and hope you have a great day.